We have the honor and the privilege of having Dr. Frank Turek on with us this morning. Frank, so much for jo thank you so much for joining us. Apologist, author, your work has, oh my goodness, influenced us in many, many ways. So thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Great to be on with you guys. Tell us a little bit more about your work. Uh, well, what we primarily do, crossexamine.org is our website back there, as you can see. Uh, what we primarily do is go to college campuses, high schools, and churches and present evidence that Christianity is true. And uh, I co-wrote a book a number of years ago with Dr. Norman Geiser called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. So that's normally the topic we're talking about, where we try and show that Christianity is true by dealing with four questions. Does truth exist? Does God exist? Are miracles possible? And is the New Testament reliable enough to let us know if Jesus rose from the dead? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity is true. And of course, we take a lot of questions and have all these Q&As on our YouTube channel. So if people are interested in that kind of thing, they can just go to the Cross-Examined YouTube channel or our website, crossexamined.org, and see all that. Beautiful. Hey, starting out, I haven't asked any of, kind of our apologist friends this one, but maybe you can help shed some light on it. Why do uh -huh. you think the secular hypothesis has really failed? So the one I'm kind of referring to is, you know, John Lennon, 1966, or Nietzsche before him, talking about how religion will go, this I'm sure of, a worldwide mm. religion as we get more mm. into a technological materialistic age. Mm -hmm. why, do you, why do you think, one, it obviously we become more religious universally, and then two, could that be a good argument against atheism? Well, actually, it's just more sociology than philosophy. You know, why do people believe what they do and do what they do? Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily use it as an argument one way or the other. I will say that I think that God has placed eternity on our hearts, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. And so we're not just thinking this life. We're thinking there's something beyond this life and there must be some meaning to this life. I mean, if there is no God, there's no ultimate meaning to anything. We're just moist robots and we're going to one day become worm food. So what's the what's the point of this life? So uh, and, and you, people may be watching going, oh, no, secularism is kind of taken over. No, it's not. Not not worldwide. You might think here in our little bubble of the United States, people are getting more secular. But in reality, across the world, religion and even Christianity is growing. So. It's not something that's ever going to go away. And I would argue with like Nietzsche or Lenin, whoever said, you know, religion's going to go away. Well, it depends on how you define religion. If you're defining religion as your explanation for ultimate reality and who to whom you put your devotion to, everybody's religious in some way. Everybody's either, at the end of the day, there's only two religions. You're either worshiping the creator or you're worshiping some aspect of the creation. And uh, some people worship some aspect of the creation like themselves. I get to do what I want. You can't tell me what I can and can't do, right? That's, that's your ultimate devotion. Everybody worships something. The only question is what? It's interesting. We just made that point to kind of this pop atheist in a debate. And he said, how dare you call me religious? And he almost, <laughs> you, know, you could see him losing it. Uh -huh, do you typically uh -huh. get that? I mean, why are atheists? I, obviously, it's, well, it kind of makes sense for them to really tee off on any Christian who says that you are religious, but I totally agree with you. And I think if you get at, whether it's in the Latin religio, it's, it's how you bind things together, or if how you get after it in terms of, yet we all have to answer these, these major issues. So maybe you're not religious in the sense of buying into one of the, the major world religions, right. mm -hmm. and yet certainly we are all religious, especially in terms of the scrupulosity, the fine tooth comb that we go over in all the details of our lives. I, I think it's also an important point to make I've been pushing atheists. And I see you do this quite well, pushing atheists to say, it's not just, I don't believe in God, but you have a worldview. And typically if you sure push you them do. far enough, they'll say something like, okay, fine. I am an atheistic humanist. Right, right, right. They all have positive worldviews. You know, it's been real fashionable lately to say atheists to say, well, I just lack a belief in God. Right. And uh, I say, well, if, if that's your definition of atheism, then really what you're just talking about is your psychological state, right? You're not telling us anything about the real world out there. You're not really telling us whether or not God exists. You're just saying that you psychologically lack a belief in God. Well, so what? You know, this water bottle lacks a belief in God. We don't call it an atheist, right? Um, you know, a puppy lacks a belief in God. We don't call it an atheist. An atheist is someone who says positively there is no God. Now, they may have 
various shades of certainty about that. So whenever somebody brings that up, Stuart, I always ask the question, you know, if they say a lack of belief in God, I say, okay, let's not argue semantics. Let me just ask you one question. Here's a proposition. God exists. Do you agree with that proposition? Do you disagree with that proposition? Or you don't know? Which one of those three uh, is, describes you? And typically they'll say, I don't know. I say, well, you're an agnostic then, right? You don't know. That's what it means to not know. Uh, if you say God doesn't exist, you're an atheist. If you say God does exist, you're a theist. You're one of those three. What else could you be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. And I love pushing atheists kind of far enough because typically mm -hmm. most of them are agnostics kind of or mm -hmm. agnostic atheists or. Mm -hmm. um, and now how about when it comes to just your top maybe three, four, five points on why is Christianity rational? So there's the God argument, but more specifically, why is Christianity rational? What would be your main go to's? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I go through four questions. Truth, God, miracles, New Testament, right? Particularly the resurrection. Because again, if the resurrection occurred, then Jesus is God and Christianity is true. Uh, and everything falls uh, like dominoes after that if, if Jesus has risen from the dead. Why? Well, look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody rises from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says. Okay? <laughs> so it's very rational. In fact, you really only need to show two, two facts, that God exists and Jesus rose from the dead. Because if God exists, then miracles are possible, like a resurrection. And if he miraculously rose Jesus from the dead after it was predicted, um, then he is God. He's validated his claim to be God. And so those are the two questions that or the two facts you need to establish. I also think Christianity is rational uh, because it, our ability to reason makes much more sense on theism than atheism, right? I mean, if we're just molecular machines, as the, many of the atheists say today, you know, they're materialists, that we're just moist robots, you know, we're we don't have free will because every thought we have is just the result of molecules bumping into one another. We shouldn't trust anything we think. We shouldn't even trust our senses to, to understand what's, what's real and true about the world. But if God exists and he's designed our brains in such a way that we can know truth, then we, then we have warrant to believe what we believe. C.S. Lewis famously said something like, if my mind is not, if my brain is not designed, it wasn't designed for thinking, he said, then my thoughts are just a byproduct of atoms bumping around in my skull. But if I can't trust my own thinking, then I can't trust any arguments leading to atheism or anything else. And therefore, I have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. The only way that I can trust my reasoning is if I believe in God. So the very, the very our very ability to reason is best explained by a great mind who set up this immaterial and material world and has given us minds so we can ascertain truth about this material world and then draw conclusions about it. Mm. Hey, the thing. I, so I had a buddy who passed away of cancer. He, he was quite a bit older than me, he was 72. He passed away of cancer about three months ago. And it was during the COVID season. So unfortunately, Sloan Kettering would not take him in, I think. If he would have gotten that kind of treatment, it would have prolonged his life quite a bit. Uh -huh. But, you know, fascinatingly enough, Scripture did not help him the most. I know that's almost heretical to say, but it was a Frank Turek line that really helped him. And that was, I said, look, if you, you're going to have to remind me fully on it. I'm just going to paraphrase here. Death is simply a change of location. Yeah, if Christ if Christianity is true, people don't die; they just change location. We just go from this life to the next life, and right. God, God is the one that has the authority to determine when that is. You know, whether we're young or old or seventy-two or whatever. That's that's His prerogative, not ours. Well, that was a powerful line, and you've done a good job in terms of kind of helping our our staff at church think through how do you take Scripture and use how Jesus did in, in parables, whether it's metaphor, analogies, whatever it might be, to help somebody, especially when it comes to counseling, understand lines like that, that can tremendously speak to their head and heart, rather than saying, okay, here's a pop you know, scripture verse, that can certainly help at times. But sure. I think your line like that is, it's very pastoral of you. Well, yeah, and a lot of times when people are in difficulty, they don't need a philosopher, they need a pastor. Hmm. And so when they're going through difficulty arguments, uh, philosophical arguments may not resonate with them. That's why whenever somebody asks me a question, you know, if God, why evil? I always want to stop and say, why are you asking that? 
Hmm. Uh, because look, if they're asking it because they're just intellectually curious and they've always wondered, well, how could there be a good God with all this evil in the world? Fine, you give the philosophical answer. But if they're asking it because their baby just died, mm -hmm. you're not going the philosophical route. They need a pastor. They don't need a philosopher. Yeah. Yep. Um, just because I really enjoy how you handle the free will versus determinism uh, debate. Sam Harris, So I, you'll probably remember that tragedy that happened up the road from us in Cheshire, Connecticut. Yeah. Home break in. Sam Harris said, look, we, we got to basically it's his deterministic argument. He said, mm -hmm. look, these guys had a bad upbringing. I don't think they had bad mental health. So you can, you know, you can go to the whole deterministic argument mm -hmm. in, a, in a kind of more simple way in terms of making the connection if someone really has kind of a, a schizophrenic break, for example. But they didn't right. have they had a, a poor upbringing. Yes, I think he went the, the route of, hey, they were abused in prison. And so they got out and it was really their, their atoms and molecules that led them to rape those women and almost kill the husband who was the doctor. How, how do you, so based off of that, I, I said that to Susan Blackmore, who's a friend with, of Sam Harris, and she did, <laughs> it's not that she didn't like me saying it, but she was like, oh, no, no, I, I don't think Sam would say that. But, but I, have, I have the written words of him actually saying that. So atheists clearly don't like going that far, but I love when they do go that far in their consistency. So there's that one, but then there's also kind of a, a couple of pop atheists who we've debated recently who, who really didn't didn't even go with that type of Sam Harris thinking. Instead, they said, we're strong materialists, and yet we also believe in free will. And that was, <laughs> it, it was totally nonsensical to me. I want to have you? both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. That's so a Terry, contradiction. Look, you're either completely determined and you don't have free will, or you have free will and you can make choices and you're not completely determined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, if determinism is true, how do you hold anybody accountable? You know, right? Did did Hitler just have bad molecules? You know what? No, we believe that people have the ability to choose to do good or do evil, and it just so happens we're born with a nature that is predis is predisposed toward evil. It's easy to be bad. It's hard to be good, right? You don't have to teach a kid to say mine. You have to teach a kid to share, right? It's very easy to be bad. It's hard to be good. It's just part of our fallen nature. That's one reason we need a savior. But the idea that we don't have free will, I mean, Sam Harris says that, but then all you need to do is ask him, did you freely say that? Did you freely come to that conclusion that we don't have free will? If so, then you do have free will. And if not, if you, if you didn't arrive at that conclusion freely, <clears throat> it's just a result of atoms bumping around in your head. Why should we believe it's true? Determinism makes reason impossible, basically. This is why in a book that I wrote called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, one of the chapters in here is on reason, because I think atheists are stealing reason from God to argue against him. There would be no such thing as reason unless, unless there was an immaterial reality that is structured in such a way, and our minds are structured in such a way so that we could reason to valid conclusions. That's not explained by molecules. That's explained by an immaterial intellectual reality that is best explained by uh, a theistic God. So whenever they're arguing there is no God, they're actually, they actually have to sit in God's lap to slap his face. They're <laughs> using something that wouldn't exist to say God doesn't exist, but they're using the thing that wouldn't exist if, if God didn't exist to say he doesn't exist. They have to steal from God to argue against him. An atheist is someone like who says, I don't believe in guns. And then he steals your guns, your gun and shoots you with it. You know, <laughs> there's no such thing as guns. And then he takes your gun and shoots you with it. That's what atheists do. <laughs> Frank, I've always been convinced that if there is no God, morality is mm -hmm. relative. Mm -hmm. But recently, more and more people have been pushing back with a line of no, there is no God. Morality is objective because it's based in reason because it is based on the most amount of happiness for the most amount of people, makes mm -hmm. sense. So that's the basis of morality. And so they get very offended when I say, I'm sorry, I disagree strongly with you. It is impossible for there to be objective morality if there is no God. What's wrong with their thinking or with my thinking? How do you think through that issue? I would simply ask them, by what standard are you judging 
something to be right or wrong. If they say the most amount of happiness, that's like utilitarianism, right? Mm -hmm. um, most amount of happiness or depend, it could be hedonism. It depends on how you define it. Um, would it be right to murder an innocent man to make an angry mob happy? Would it? I mean, if that's your standard mm -hmm. and, and why, why is happiness uh, the standard? Who said? You said? What if somebody else comes along and disagrees with you? Why is he wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, what if Hitler wants to make the Aryan race the happiest and the most prosperous, and he wants to kill everybody else and take all their materials, all their resources, so he can create the Uber race? Why is he wrong? Mm -hmm. There's no way to adjudicate between human opinion unless there's a standard of goodness or righteousness beyond us that we're obligated to obey. And then any deviation from that standard would be what we would call evil. If, if that standard doesn't exist, then you couldn't say, you couldn't say that say uh, a, a mother Teresa type character who helps the poor is, is better than Hitler. You would just say they're different. Mm -hmm. Right. Also, I, I always ask people this question when it comes to morality. How do you know that your, quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing an interception. Well, the only way you could know is if you knew the goal of the game, right? Mm -hmm. If you know the goal of the game, you can say, okay, touchdown's better for us than our guy throwing an interception. Right? right. But if there's no goal to the game, there's no difference in those two plays from a qualitative yeah. perspective. And if there's no goal to life and there's no ultimate goal to human beings, you can't yeah. say that helping a human being is better than murdering a human being. Right. Because with, without a goal, without a purpose, morality doesn't exist. Right. And so you have to have a purpose to know whether something's good or bad or whether you're getting closer to the good, to, to, to the standard you want or further away. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you were at Davidson College and the students were arguing that there is no such thing as objective truth. What was the line of thinking that you tried to push? Well, I would ask them, is that objectively true? Because any, any affirmation of subjective truth implies objective truth. If I say all truth is, is subjective, I'm assuming that that particular truth is objective, right? It's like when people say there's no truth, I ask them, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Right. Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. It's self-defeating. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. And that's why we spend a lot of time in the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist book. The first two chapters are just all about truth. Right. And how you can detect false statements. Because, Cliff, you know, you've done this even longer than I have on a college campus. There are kids out there that will have their own little absolute and they'll relativize everything else. Mm -hmm. And then you ask them, well, why is your position absolute? You just got done telling me there are no absolutes, right? Right. right. And one of the problems that I think atheists uh, run into or one of the errors they make is they exempt themselves from their own theories. Yes. Like, for example, Daniel Dennett, or well, let's go back to uh, Sam Harris. You know, the guy, he claims that they don't have free will. He doesn't, no one has free will. But he actually thinks he has free will, right? Right. He has that free will to say that. Right. OK, because if he's not saying it freely, then why believe it? Daniel Dennett, a colleague of his, says consciousness is an illusion. Well, one wonders if when he if he was conscious when he wrote that. Right. <laughs> he he doesn't think his consciousness is an illusion. He exempts himself from his own theory, but he thinks everybody else is consciousness is an illusion. And right. by the way, in order to know consciousness is an illusion, you'd have to get outside of your own consciousness to see that the consciousness that you thought you had is just an illusion. It's kind of like having a dream. What's the only way you can know you're having a dream? You have to wake up and go, whoo, that was just a dream. Yep. In other words, you got to get outside the dream to know yep. that what you had was just a dream. Same thing is true with the illusion of consciousness. If consciousness is an illusion, you'd have to get outside of the illusion in order to say that was just an illusion. In other words, you'd have to get some kind of universal perspective. You'd have to be like God to say that our consciousness is just an illusion. And so yeah. atheists do this all the time. They claim everybody's a molecular machine, but they don't think they're molecular machines. They think they're reasoning validly to, to conclusions, right? Right. right. You know, so I, I, I think we always need to, to, to test 
the claims that that non-believers make and see if they meet their own standard. Many times they don't. They don't meet their own standard. Yep. yep. Well put. All right. I think the anthropic principle is great. How do you understand the anthropic principle and what are your best illustrations of the anthropic principle? Yeah, good question. Actually, the term anthropic principle has a couple of different meanings now. When we wrote the book back in 04, it was like at least we understood that most people thought it meant the universe is fine tuned for life to exist, right? Now some people are using the anthropic principle in another sense. So I like to use just the argument from fine tuning. And the argument from fine tuning says that the universe is so precisely tweaked that there are certain factors about our universe, certain constants in the laws of nature, the laws of nature themselves, which are so precisely uh, fine tuned that if they were different, just a hair's breadth either way, there'd either be no universe or new uni you know, no universe that could support life. I'll just give you two quick examples of this. And one of them comes from atheist Stephen Hawking, who, as you know, died a few years ago. But even he said this. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. In other words, from the very beginning, if the expansion rate wasn't precisely what it was, we would have no universe, right? Now, you can't make sort of any evolutionary explanation for this. Why? Because the expansion rate did not evolve to that point. The expansion rate started there with the creation of the universe. In other words, yep. it's part of the initial conditions of the universe. And if the universe had a beginning, and even the atheists are admitting that, space, time, and matter had a beginning, it seems to me the same spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent being that created the universe. Hang on. This shouldn't be happening. But anyway, um, it was just my assistant calling me. I thought that was off. It is off. Why am I? I obviously, this computer is not fine-tuned, Cl uh, Cliff. So <laughs> what's going on here? Um, but anyway, um, where were we? We were talking about the expansion rate, that the same being that created space, matter, and time seems to be the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be so we could even be here talking today. That's one aspect. The second aspect, which I like to talk about, is also the fact that the gravitational force is fine-tuned to 1 in 10 to the 40th power. That's one part in 1 with 40 zeros following it. And you go, well, Frank, you know, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. So here's an illustration. If you were to take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire known universe, which is a long way, and set the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure, I realize gravity is not measured in inches, but this just gives you a scale idea so you can understand the, the precision of 1 in 10 to the 40th. If the strength of gravity were different by one inch in either direction, across the scale as wide as the entire known universe, we wouldn't be here. Now, there's only two possible reasons for that value being where it is. It's either It was either designed to be there or it wasn't designed to be there. Now, which conclusion makes the most sense? I don't have enough faith to believe that that value landed there by chance, whatever that means, right? Chance is not a cause. Scientists use the word chance like it's a cause. Chance isn't a cause. It's just a, a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities, right? Chance doesn't cause a thing. So it seems to me that that value was placed there by the same mind that fine-tuned the universe and created and fine-tuned the universe and so many other constants of nature. So in fact, even Christopher Hitchens, who I debated many years ago, I don't, you got, I don't know if you remember Christopher, he was a brilliant British atheist yep. who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. Yeah. Um, even he said, that's the hardest argument for an atheist. You know, why is the universe just balanced on a razor's edge? You know, a, it defies explanation from a naturalistic perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pull in a, a couple questions here. We got a lot of them. Mm -hmm. so sorry, guys, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. But Josiah asked, do animals have free will? Don't atheists believe we're just evolved animals? It depends on what you mean by free will. I mean, obviously, they can make certain choices, right? Um, but do they free, do they have the same, 
a kind of a free will that we have where we can make moral choices? And the answer is no. Now you might think when your your dog poops on your carpet, okay, he's immoral, but you know, <laughs> he may be getting back at you for some, but he doesn't really understand morality, right? You're just training him. You know, if a uh, if a lion eats a gazelle, you know, it, he doesn't murder the gazelle. It's not a, it's not a moral creature. It's just part of the nature of of, of nature. Um, so they have free will in the sense that they can make certain choices because we have animals that do that. But it, it's not in the moral sense of the term that they have free will. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. We recently had a, a another pop atheist who he was doing the Nietzschean power play, kind of just shouting us down. And, you know, he was being really nasty towards Jesus, actually. not just is, it, is this on campus, you mean? No, this is, oh, yeah. so we've been doing, we just started doing debates about, I mean, really just since COVID season, started doing uh -huh. debates on YouTube. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it's, it's fascinating because this guy was just teeing off on Christ. Usually we get, I'm sure you get teeing off on Christianity or the church, maybe God, but Jesus Christ, hard to tee off on. But I mean, he mm -hmm. was, he, he said, F Jesus Christ, F you guys, every, I mean, he pulled out every word in the book. And it, it was it was hilarious, though, because he went the whole route of many atheists today, which is this whole veganism push. Oh, yeah. So all of a sudden we saw this tremendously angry guy who was so angry towards Jesus turn and say, oh, oh, by the way, in this very soft kind of gentle voice, like I am, though, giving up certain meats and I am learning to be more gentle and kind and loving towards my fellow animal. And it's not just him who's kind of going in that direction. And I know statistically, it's kind of interesting. A recent stat came out that I think it was something like 42% of people would save the lives of their dogs over a human who they didn't know, you know, across mm. the street. Mm. I don't know if you see this. We've seen this on college campuses where it's this push towards, oh, you know, the, another college student said, the worst evil that I know of is puppies' tails on fire. And so we've seen this push towards this, this I mean, animals, their free will, they have souls. And the elevation almost, and I think it happens in a godless society. I think it's connected to a more godless society where the image of God in humans is almost decreasing in, a, in many different ways. You talk about Peter Singer and many others who are clearly going after in that direction. And mm -hmm. animals are just climbing up the ladder. So it's almost like humans coming down, animals are coming up, and we're going to meet each other here soon. Well, I think part of that might be, like when I look at a puppy or even a dog, you know, most dogs are, um, they exhibit unconditional love. Like if you leave the house for 10 minutes and you come back, it's like you again. Wow. You know, <laughs> they're wagging their tails. They're jumping all over you. Where have you been? Did I miss you? Right. doesn't matter whether you've had a good day or bad. Like they never have a bad day. Right. I kind of see that as the way God expresses grace through animals. Right. You could see why people would would love dogs because they they are so friendly and they they're always forgiving they you know you know they they're your best friend that's why they we call them you know the man's best friend is his dog right so i can see why people have a, a real soft spot for animals uh but jesus is the same way in the sense that he's he's offering grace just like a dog does to you he's offering grace forgiveness right it's all forgiven um, so I, I understand why people are doing that. They want something that's, they want unconditional love. They just want people to accept them, so to speak, and forgive any evil they've done. The problem is a lot of people in today's culture want to redefine evil as good. Anything I do is fine. And God has to accept anything I do. And if he doesn't accept anything I want to do, particularly sexually, well, so much for God. <laughs> right. All right. Danny R. Why do you think Jesus's bloodline, his brothers and sisters, were not more involved and significant to the early church, being that they were direct family of the Messiah? Well, they were because James was his half brother who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So I would actually say that Jesus's half brother, James, who was not a believer when Jesus was on the earth prior to his resurrection, as John 7, 5 says, which, by the way, is an embarrassing detail, right? Your own brothers don't believe in you. That's embarrassing. They're not making that up, okay? There's embarrassing details throughout the Old and New Testaments that are not invented stories, quite obviously. But then James dies as a martyr as the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And it's not even a New Testament document that tells us this. Josephus, the Jewish historian, 
who was probably in Jerusalem in 62 AD when this happened, because he lived from 37 AD to about 100 AD. And another writer who lived later, Hegesippus, they tell us that James dies as a martyr at the hands of the Sanhedrin. You know, he's stoned to death after he's thrown off the temple. Well, why is James dying as a martyr for his brother in the very city Jesus is alleged to have risen from the dead in about 30 years later, unless Jesus rose from the dead, right? I mean, why is he doing this? It doesn't make any sense that this is a, a made up story that his own brother's dying as a martyr for him. Rob Dev says, or asks, what's the best argument for atheism? Atheists don't have arguments for atheism. What they have are complaints about the way God's running the universe, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's no positive argument for atheism. There's there's complaints like, well, why would God allow evil if there's a good God? You know, uh, those are those are complaints about the way God's running the universe. But I don't think there are good arguments for atheism because logically evil wouldn't even make sense unless there's a standard of good because evil doesn't exist on its own. It only exists as a lack in a good thing. I, I, a couple of analogies may help. You know, evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? Hmm. It doesn't exist, right? Or evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. If you take all the car out of the rust, you got nothing. So evil only exists as a privation or a lack or a deficiency in a good thing. So if evil exists, you're presupposing good. But as soon as you presuppose good, you're back to God, because God is what we mean by the standard of objective good. If there's no God, nothing's objectively good or bad. Everything's just a matter of human opinion. So evil doesn't disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there, but it doesn't disprove God. So you can ask the question, why would a good God allow evil to occur? That's a good question. But you can't say, because there's evil in the world, God doesn't exist. Because as soon as you admit evil, you're admitting good, and then you're admitting God. And Lewis, C.S. Lewis, of course, made this point in Mere Christianity. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. Similarly, you wouldn't know what unjustice was unless you knew what justice was. But justice wouldn't exist unless God exists. It's mm, good. So, so his cool. point, and by the way, this is what we yeah. mean by the philosophical answer to the problem of evil. This doesn't work when somebody just lost their baby, right? That's why you wouldn't say, oh, you wouldn't have evil unless you had good. You know, that's mm -hmm. you've got to take a different approach. And I, so that was kind of the ultimate one that, that Christians had to face, sounding like, 20 years ago, but from a philosophical mm -hmm. standpoint, ha, isn't it true that in the last 20 years, it's kind of swayed more so to, towards Christianity? It's, it's really, there's no more books being written about the evil argument from the atheist position. Yeah, that's right. Philosophically, even atheists admit that evil can't disprove God. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Cruel Britannia asks, could Frank go through the tape measure thing again? It's a lot of information to go through. The tape measure thing. All right. Well, the tape measure is just a scale, right? So if you could stretch a tape measure across the entire known universe, which are trillions and trillions and trillions of miles, right? And you were to set the gravitational force at an inch mark on that tape measure. One in 10 to the 40th precision would be that you couldn't move the gravitational force one inch in either direction across that whole scale. That's how precise one in 10 to the 40th precision is. And maybe um, a way of uh, describing this in a, in a different sense to help people understand, when we're talking one in 10 to the 40th precision, this is like scientific notation, one in 10 to the 40 precision, um, is one in one with 40 zeros following it. So if you see a number like 10 to the 40, and then you ask somebody, how much bigger is 10 to the 40 than 10 to the 39? What's the answer? 10 to the 40 is 10 times bigger than 10 to the 39. See, you're adding a zero. 10 to the 41 is 10 times bigger than 10 to the 40. There's only 10 to the nine, uh, what is it? 10 to the 79 atoms in the entire universe. 
atoms, according to scientists. And yet, at 10 to the 40 precision, it's mind-boggling. It's hard to even imagine. So what we're saying is there's virtually zero probability that this happened by some non-intelligent means. Look, either that value was put there by intelligence or it wasn't. What's 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 more reasonable? Hmm. Somebody with intelligence put that value where it is so we could have this universe. Mm -hmm. Do you something? Or should I keep going here? Keep going. All right. Our good buddy, Chris Morris. Chris, great to have you on. Um, ask, is there anything that nullifies exclusivity on which moral objectiveness stands? Say that again. I don't know if I got the, the gist of that question. Is well, what's there the biggest more? pushback I think he's asking when it comes to moral objectivity? The biggest pushback? People in denial. Because everybody knows that, say, torturing babies for fun is wrong. You shouldn't even have to make an argument for it. You don't need an argument. You already know it's wrong. The question is, why do I have this intuition that torturing babies for fun is wrong? Mm. Why is it wrong? If it's just my opinion, it's not really wrong. It's just my opinion. It's a preference. But if there's a standard beyond me that establishes value, because the standard itself is value, and any deviation from that standard is what we would call evil, then I can say torturing babies for fun is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because babies are made in the image of God, and babies have a purpose, and life has a purpose. And, and cutting that life short or unduly harming that life is evil. It goes against what we ought to be doing. And this is why when people say, you know, I don't really know that, say, torturing babies for fun is wrong or murder is wrong. I ask them, do you really have any doubt that murder is wrong? Because you, I know you don't. You're just saying that. In fact, Jay Budzhevsky, who's a professor at UT Austin, wrote a book. It's on my shelf over here somewhere. It's called What You Can't Not Know. What You Can't Not Know. You can't not know torturing babies for fun is wrong. You can't not know murder is wrong. You already know it's wrong. You may suppress it. You may be talked out of it by propaganda, but in your heart, you know it's wrong. But it's not just about knowing it's wrong. It's about why is it wrong? You see, atheists always confused epistemology and ontology. These are big words philosophers use. Epistemology is just how you know something, but ontology is the study of the thing you know. Like, why does it exist? And some atheists will say, hey, I don't need God to know right and wrong, or I don't need God to be a good person, to which we'd respond, well, that's true. You can know right and wrong and deny there's a God. You can do good things and deny there's a God. But you can't justify what is a good thing unless God exists. It's like saying, it's like me reading a book and saying, look, I know what the book says and then denying there's an author, right? I mean, I can read a book and know what it means and know what it says. I can even obey what the book says and still deny there's an author. However, there would be no book to know or obey unless there was an author. The same thing is true with morality. You can know right and wrong. You can do right and wrong, but there would be no right or wrong unless there's a standard beyond us. And that's what we mean by God's nature, the standard of rightness. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes me think of Christian Smith's new book, Atheist Overreach, and how hmm. he talks about he, he really went after he got he was on. What's his name? Is it Richard Shermer? I, who I think you debated. Uh, Michael Shermer. Michael yeah. Shermer from Skeptic mm -hmm. Magazine. And he really put it to him. I was very impressed because he's not an apologist at all. Yeah. And, you know, he's he, he's not dry, but he, he's definitely more reserved. And yet he mm -hmm. kind of went after him in a beautiful way. And, and how did Sherman respond? Do you, do well, you remember? He was going after him on mainly, and Sherman had no response to this, saying that the atheistic worldview, kind of like you said, you certainly can be good without God, but there's no obligation. There's no oughtness to being good. But he, right. he was more so saying atheist overreach in the sense of if you truly think going over and helping people who are outside of your tribe and especially disadvantaging yourself for people who are on the other side of the world, that that's a really good thing or that's there's anything that necessitates that. Mm -hmm. then that's just a clear atheist overreach. And now mm -hmm. you based off of your worldview, you, again, you can be a good person and you can do good things, but let's not push it too far. 
And he, he yeah, kind of you, kept you, saying see, that. You'd have to steal good from God to even have a standard. That's the point of the stealing from God book. What, right. what do you mean by good? If we're just molecular machines, if there's no purpose to life, there is no such thing as good. You have to yeah. import that. You have to steal that from a theistic worldview in order to make your system work. You're smuggling in God into the back door or a standard into the back door to make your system work. That's why even Sam Harris, who says in his Moral Sense book, well, human flourishing is the standard of good. Well, who says? Sam Harris says that's Why? Why right, human right. flourishing? Why not roach flourishing? Or which human flourishing? The Nazi human flourishing or the Jews human flourishing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Who said? Right. So he's got, he's got no standard and, and there's no sense of obligation. He's trying to get an ought from molecules. You don't get an ought from molecules. Mm -hmm. You can get an ought from a perfectly good being who has created and sustains us, but you can't get an ought from a bunch of molecules bumping into one another. Mm -hmm. All right. Sotlov asks, if God knew mankind would sin, why would mm -hmm. he create humanity? If he knows who will go to hell, why create those going to hell? Okay, good question. Well, if uh, every parent knows that at some point their kids are going to sin, so why did you bring them into this world? Mm. Well, because you knew that giving free creatures free will is a good thing. That's the only way they can love. Now, they're going to use that free will to do evil sometimes, just like we do. This is why sometimes when people ask me the question, in fact, I had it at Michigan State years ago, some atheist was at the presentation and and as soon as he put his hand up for a question he was the first guy to put his hand up for a question i said yes sir he said if there is a good god why doesn't he stop all the evil in the world and i said sir that's an excellent question maybe because if he did he might start with you and me because we do evil every day you ever notice when we complain about evil we're always complaining about somebody else doing it hey god why don't you stop him or god why don't you stop her we never think of ourselves if God wanted to stop evil, he could. He could just end our free will right now. He could just take us out. Evil done. Problem solved. But if he does that, then we're not free creatures anymore, and we can't love either. So God has two options to end evil. He could end our free will, or he can just quarantine evil. Mm -hmm. What does he do? He quarantines it, ultimately. He gives people a free choice, and then he says, okay, you don't want to live with me? I get it. You won't. You'll be quarantined in a place called hell. Now, why would God create people he knew would go to hell? Well, let's say Richard Dawkins never becomes a Christian. He's an atheist, right? When God elected to create the universe, he knew Richard Dawkins would not believe. But that doesn't mean that Richard Dawkins ha has no free will. Um, when, uh, when a mother puts her baby down for, uh, for a nap, or at night to go to bed, she knows at some point that kid's going to wake up and want to eat, right? But because she knows that the baby's going to want to wake up and eat, does that mean she's causing the baby to wake up and eat? No. Knowledge doesn't necessarily imply causality. Just because God knows what we're going to do doesn't mean he's causing us to do it. Mm -hmm. So he knows what we're going to do, but he's not causing us directly to do it. He gives us free will. Mm -hmm. And even atheists get God's will done. You say, how so? Well, Richard Dawkins writes a book, The God Delusion. A Christian picks it up and reads it and goes, hmm, hadn't thought of that argument. <clears throat> Guess I got to get some, I got to do some research, learn more about God and learn more about these arguments. So the Christian, as a result, gets closer to God by reading an atheist book. In fact, uh, my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, used to say, I read atheists for devotions because their arguments are so bad that I actually go, wow, this is the best you got. And if they do give a good argument, then I've got to go look it up and figure out how to answer it. Right. So even God can get his free will done or his will done through atheists. In fact, none of us would be here right now if it wasn't for atheists. Why? I'm sure there are atheists in our bloodline who, you know, uh, wouldn't have given birth to us if they didn't exist, which means we wouldn't even be here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and and I and it, it was the philosopher William James, it wasn't even a Christian, said this about evil. He said, the world is better for having Satan in it as long as we keep our foot on his neck. Now, what did he mean by that? 
he meant that evil actually can produce good. Sometimes you want to look up when you're on your back, right? Sometimes people only find God when they go through difficulty. Paul says that uh, perseverance produces character and character hope. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Joy? Does any Christian really do that? No, we don't, right? We don't count it joy when we fall into various trials. But that's what James says. Why? Because it produces patience. It produces the character that you need. Paul says our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us a greater weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen for what is seen is temporary, but on what is unseen for what is unseen is eternal. In other words, you're actually enhancing your capacity to enjoy God by going through difficulty. Just like a Super Bowl winning quarterback enjoys holding the Lombardi trophy up better than the third string quarterback who didn't play a down all year. Why? Because he actually went through all the difficulty of winning the award. You enhance your capacity by going through difficulty to enjoy the reward than if you're not in the game at all. And this is what Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. That was what I just mentioned there. So, yes, uh, atheists actually help get God his uh, help get God's will done by doing what they do. And um they still freely decide where they're going. God does not force them into hell. They They've decided what to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe just one or more, one or two. Frank, you tell us. I mean, you've done so well on the hot seat. We've been very impressed here. So you let us know when you want to take off. Yeah, but, we're good. Uh, Go ahead. You know, it's, I, I think just along those lines, hearing like a Celine, not Celine Dion, a Dion <laughs> Sanders say you know, after he won his first Super Bowl, it was the loneliest night of my life, most one of the more depressing moments of my life. And it's after the Super Bowl. Yeah. And then you have different, I mean, Tom Brady said something similar. Kobe <laughs> Bryant said something similar. He said, just worship the grind because mm -hmm. ultimately the NBA championship is not going to get you that kind of happiness. Like you're saying. That's right. Yeah. No, Tom Brady said it, you know, this is it. We right. won. What now? Exactly. Well, that's it, dude. That's there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> what now? Oh, Tom, are you going to come back and try and do it next year? You mean right. this is this isn't it? <laughs> Can you do it next year, Tom? We just <laughs> poor guys <don't. laughs> probably not. Actually, it's really hard to do. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> it's like yeah, you guys know this. After you write a book, somebody says, oh, "Are you working on anything else?" Like, what? Give me a break! I just got done with this one. <laughs> you know, Madonna has a really good illustration on that. She oh, talks about bad. how she just like bathes in this type of acclamation, you know, all the pats on the back from her audience. But then within the next two weeks after finishing a concert, she is like a total stress ball on the verge of having an emotional breakdown because she knows she has to do it again. Yeah. I think yeah, so many celebrities, yeah. actors have to do that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. It's it's like R.K. Rowling who wrote or J.K. Rowling, Joanne Rowling, who wrote all the Harry Potter books, which a lot of Christians have boycotted. I get it. But <laughs> If you look at the Harry Potter, I know it's gonna. This is gonna, this is gonna be the most controversial thing I say. Harry Potter is the is his life in those books parallels the life of Christ, unlike just about any other character in any book. He actually dies for his friends and rises from the dead. You know? <laughs> and Rowling admitted this. She goes, "Yeah, you know, it's kind of British books. There's gonna be Bible verses in it, you know." And <laughs> but anyway, she. She says, look, I'm not going to try and recreate that. I can't. It's done. It's over. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know that the next thing I write isn't going to have that kind of success. So she's admitted that, you know, this this isn't it. And always trying to achieve the, the you know, the next great buzz isn't going to isn't going to satisfy anyway. Mm hmm. Well, we're highly offended that you brought up Harry Potter, and I really yeah, hope yeah. you're not. I've got this home. right now. Burn this right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, school projects. I, you know, I, this is taking me back to seminary right here. Good question. What are your thoughts about Jonathan Edwards' preferential use of the term volition instead of free will? I'm not a student of Jonathan Edwards, so I don't know what he would have meant by that. But I think you either have free will or you don't. Uh, in fact, my um, my co-author, Dr. Geiser, years ago had a debate with uh, Jonathan Gerstner. They were both professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, and Gerstner, according to Ed, according to Geiser, was like the reincarnation of Jonathan Edwards. 
And they were debating the free will Calvinism thing. And Geiser asked Gerstner this question, does man have free will? And Gerstner said, yes, man has free will to do what he desires, but God gives him the desires of his heart. And Geisler said, well, then who gave Satan the desire to sin? And Gerstner said, mystery. And Geisler said, contradiction. Because now you've made God the author of evil. Either if he's given us the desires to do evil, then he's the author of evil, right? Look, you either have free will or you don't. Now, obviously, there are limits on your free will. I don't have free will to jump 100 feet in the air. I get that, okay? But I can make libertarian choices between um, options in front of me. I can either choose God or not choose God, not without the help of the Holy Spirit. We all agree on that, that the Holy Spirit needs to um, convict us. But we can still resist the Holy Spirit and go our own way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do, quite obviously. Because, look, if God wants all to be saved, and he says that several times in the scriptures, and some people aren't saved, well, how come? Because people have free will to reject him. That's why. Mm -hmm. What number, asked Danny, did Celine Dion wear for the Cowboys? Okay, Celine Dion, I, I, she slips off of my tongue occasionally just because he listens to Celine Dion every time he does the dishes, all right? So Dion she's always Sanders. playing in the background. It was number 21. <laughs> but yeah, prime time was wearing 21. Okay, there you go. <laughs> all right, before we close, Frank, give us one more time your top, I think it was your top four for why is Christianity rational? I know one of them well, you said was reason and resurrection. Yeah, why is it true? Does truth exist? If somebody says there's no truth, you just ask them, is that true? Of course it exists. Uh, by the way, if there's no truth, then atheism couldn't be true, right? Duh, of course there's truth. You'd never go to school if there was no truth. Second question, does God exist? And the arguments we typically give for God are the argument from the beginning of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, and the moral argument. We talked a little bit about them here today. And by the way, when you combine those three arguments, attributes of the cause of those three things naturally flow from the data. For example, if space, matter, and time had a beginning, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, because only persons can make choices. And to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice. And the being would also have to be intelligent in order to have a mind to make a choice. And then you add the fine tuning argument we talked about in there that just adds more intelligence to this being. You add the moral argument. Now you have a moral being. So from those three arguments, you get a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created and sustains all things to this very moment. Now, we haven't opened the Bible yet, and we have what appears to be the, the God of the Bible. Now, maybe it's some other God. We don't know. But that's why we got to go on to question three. Are miracles possible? And a lot of people don't believe in miracles. But I always say, look, the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the data for it. What's the greatest miracle? It's Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible. Right. Because if God can create the universe out of nothing, he can do whatever he wants. It's not logically impossible inside the universe. He can raise Jesus from the dead if he can create the whole universe out of nothing. The only question we have now is the fourth question. Did he really raise Jesus from the dead? And we look at a lot of evidence that shows, yeah, Jesus really did rise from the dead. You look at the New Testament documents and the writers and what happened to them and why they would say this. And in fact, I like to say this. I know this sounds heretical to people who believe in an inerrant Bible like I do. I like to say this, that Christianity is not true because the series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. And people go, wait, how can that be? Because Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. I mean, do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Of course. Why? Because they resurrected, because they, they witnessed the resurrected Jesus. That's why they were Christians, not because they read it in a book. Now, they eventually wrote it down so we could know about it. But it was true before they wrote it down. I mean, just ask the question, what came first, the New Testament or the resurrection? The resurrection came first. Then they wrote it down. In fact, you could put it this way. 
The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. Mm. You wouldn't have the New Testament written by Jews in the first century who didn't believe a man could be God. They thought that was blasphemy and didn't believe there'd be a resurrection in the middle of time. They thought there would be one at the end. You wouldn't have that written by Jews in the first century unless Jesus rose from the dead. They wouldn't have gone and died for it and all that. No, they wouldn't. So even if the Bible has errors in it, which I don't think it does, but even if it did, Christianity would still be true. Mm. Because Beautiful. it started with an event, an event that can be verified. Christianity is the only really world religion you can verify through evidence. Right? Mm -hmm. You can see if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christianity's false. Mm -hmm. You might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week. <laughs> he didn't rise from the dead. Oh, wow. That, that summary right there, my gosh. You guys should all listen to that and record that little piece. Put it on your phone, put it on your fridge, wherever you want to put it. But that was excellent, that, that final few minutes there. Thank well, you well, so much, Frank. Yeah, go to our YouTube channel. Two words in the – two words, I think. Cross-examine. Go to our website, crossexamine.org, and download our free app. Two words in the App Store, cross-examine. You can get our podcast on there once a week. You can get our um, TV show, which airs on DirecTV and Roku. Uh, once a week, it's all right there on the app. There's a quick answer section. There's all sorts of good stuff on the app. So download that and tell so your the friends. App has, the, the app, the website, your podcast, YouTube channel. We'll put the links for the books as well. Okay, good. And th that, I mean, you got a ton of resources there. Is, is Anything else? Are those the main um, ones? Uh, do I have any other resources? Gee, I don't know. I got plenty of books in my office. I can tell you that. But um <laughs> Yeah, I you know the stuff we do every week. We're yeah. going to get a podcast every week, a TV show every week. Um, sometimes we do live streams uh, uh, quite a bit. So check all that out. Our website will have it all. Crossexamine.org. Love it. So. All right. If you are new, hit the subscribe button and the bell. We've got some debates coming out next week. And Frank, thanks again. You're an animal. In the well, sense of I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just an overgrown primate, according to my. <laughs> so that's all I am. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Right, thanks, Cliff. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. See you guys. Appreciate right. it.